Hello, Alon Sariel. It is such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for making this time. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me. It's completely my pleasure. Great, wonderful. Um, so I wanted to, uh, of course, this is a chance for everybody in Vancouver to get to know you before you come as artists in residence. Um, I was curious, one thing I like to ask people is, what was your first encounter with music? What what music connect you, that you connected with first off when you were a young person? Wow. So I don't remember the very first one, but uh, some sometime at high school when I was already quite interested in music as a teenager, um, I used to my my school was just next next to the uh, conservatory, uh, and in the conservatory hall the Beersheba Sinfonietta used to rehearse, and I I had a time where I was actually teaching classes and kind of you know sneaking in and listening to rehearsals. Um, with 15 or 16 and I remember I was uh, fascinated by this whole work by this whole um, I mean I thought how lucky are these people to be going to work and this is how work looks like they sit in this beautiful hall make beautiful music and communicate with each other and so yeah it was it was definitely a moment where, where I thought Wow, I'd like to do that. And what about at home? Did you have any musical parents or any music at home? So I grew up with uh, four older siblings. We are we are a family of five, and they all played some instruments. Uh, some played the recorder or the accordion, piano, and uh, there were instruments at home, and. Uh, I guess, yeah, I, I wanted to somehow, you know, belong to, to the party. Um, but of course, in a personal way, in a different way, and I picked an instrument that uh, wasn't there yet. I also remember that um, that uh, in, in, the, in the 90s, of course, rock and roll was uh, the thing. And I remember MTV, uh, you know, Going, going on in our living room for uh, some some hours, especially when when my parents weren't there, decibels went higher and higher, mm -hmm. and uh, so basically I, I got to 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 got to know these uh, these bands that my um, elder brothers were, were fan of, fans of, and uh, yeah, this was my my way into into music. I actually wanted to play the electric guitar as a kid. And uh, I told my mom, let, let me play electric guitar. She actually took me to the conservatory. And what they told me is, you're too small. You're too uh, young for that. You can start with like 12 or 13. But in your age, I was eight at the time. Why don't you take the mandolin? It's very similar. You know, you hold it like this. You know? And we have a mandolin orchestra. You, you would love it, which was absolutely true. And um, yeah, in the mandolin orchestra, I made my first steps in music. I think that's I think that's amazing because it's rare to meet a musician who ends up playing professionally the first instrument that got into their hands at age eight years old. That's really amazing. And your siblings uh, were they more in, in like not classical music? Or did they continue with the more electric? Yeah. Well, yeah. Today, none of them are. Uh, none of them is a professional musician. But uh, yeah, occasionally there is uh, house music, especially my sister is uh, keeping to keeping with the piano and so on. Okay. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I wanted to just also ask, um, you know, in our lives as musicians, as anybody really, uh, we always have special people that walk into our lives, special mentors, uh, people that influence us one way or another. So who, who were your strongest mentors? Oh, I had many. I was lucky. I was lucky. To name one, I think it would be um, one of my... Uh, so I, I, I came into the academy in Jerusalem. There was a very, from today's point of view, quite strange kind of habit. But mandolin players were allowed to... Uh, because there was no mandolin class in Jerusalem at the academy, mandolinists were allowed to be part of the violin class and I received uh, lessons with 
a violin player, Professor Moti Schmidt. He was um, concertmeister of the Radio Symphony in Jerusalem and in Cologne. And he was a, an amazing persona, um, mm. influenced me in many, many ways. I remember there were lessons where we didn't even open the instruments. We were talking a lot, uh, exchanging books, and he was sending me to see an exhibition. Or he was this kind of an artist in, yeah, he was just an artist. That's, that's beautiful because also I think, uh, I can't remember who said it first, uh, but you know, the idea that the best way to become a really good musician is not so much practicing, but living and going to museums and reading books. I mean, it, it, because when you're a musician, you 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 play the way you are. And so just this, of course, whole culture of life is so important and how beautiful that you could find that at an, at an early age, really. Um, yeah. Any other special teachers or mentors in your life later on? Yeah, so um, because of my interest in early music, it happened that I formed a trio with two uh, two colleagues, two uh, fellow students in Jerusalem, and they had kind of proper early music instruments. They were playing, one was playing the gamba and the other one was playing the recorder. And uh, what could we have done as a trio? So of course, it's kind of Bach trio sonatas, and uh, I was playing some continuo on a mandolin, learning by doing, because no one could actually show me. Um, and there I had a wonderful uh, coach, uh, Professor Michael Melzer, and he was a flutist and the next uh, student of uh, Bart Koiken. And uh, he really opened our minds to everything which we call historical performance practice and, and the, whole, the whole way of, of thinking about music. Now, we ended up... Uh, uh, winning some chamber music competitions at the academy, and we were we were awarded the possibility um, to exchange to to go to the Brussels Royal Conservatory for a semester, and um, of course there was a wonderful uh, gamba teacher and there was an extraordinary flute teacher, but there was no mandolin teacher. And I thought, I thought this is my my chance. I would really like to go into the lute class this time. And uh, here I was lucky again because I I sent a, I think yeah it was a DVD of myself playing the Bach Chacon on the mandolin, and uh, I explained the situation to the professor uh, Philippe Malfe, was uh, at the time teaching lute in Brussels, and I said. I never had the chance to play the lute, but I'm. I'm. This is kind of a voice of voice I'm. I'm looking for, mm. and uh, he was generous enough and open enough and curious, and he got got me into the class. And another wonderful lute player, Nicola Achten, uh, provided me a lute, uh, a beginner's instrument. This was kind of my my first steps with the instrument that I play until today, and I I am. Very, very grateful for how, how these things all happened. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I, I can understand it might be interesting for a teacher to take somebody who doesn't come from the modern guitar. It's like mandolin is different, right? So yet again, yeah, uh, yeah wonderful. And and nice that you connected with Nicolas Achten, who's a good friend and a mentor to many, many people in many mm -hmm. different disciplines as well, for sure. This this leads well maybe into another topic I wanted to explore with you, which is, um, I guess, um, the idea of the historical performance practice and, and the research involved in that, which I think, uh, you know, we have this family of early music archeologists, I call us, you know, where people who, you know, you cannot really perform this music without being interested, of course, in the whole historical side. And, and, you have so many wonderful projects, which we're really getting to, I promise. Uh, but this means that you have to have this dual interest, performance and research, uh, I think, probably. So do you want to tell us, do, do you, is this something you enjoy, this, this dual life? <laughs> uh, very much, very much. Um, I like diversity in every form. And I think life is much richer when you when you have several disciplines 
that you follow and uh, invest in. So, yeah, in my case, it's it's sometimes on the extreme level, and I have to kind of <laughs> see that I have everything under control because of the all of the different instruments and what they require um, on practice hours, on maintenance, on, and so on. Um, but I, I love the, just, I mean, just the historical mandolins, if you have a look at the historical mandolins, they're also so uh, diverse and you have the, the Neapolitan ones and the Milanese. And recently I, I got one Lombard mandolin restored, which is a world of its own. And then I have this Israeli copy that I, that I played, it was made for me. Um, and this is just mandolins and each one kind of, you know, has its specific repertoire and way of, of playing and dealing with it and its own, uh, yeah, so. That, that is that's, that's amazing. And, and of course, it, it demands a lot of, uh, need space to put them all somewhere, especially the larger ones. Mandolins at least don't take too much space. But but also just figuring out, yeah, all the string gauge and everything. I mean, it's it's a lot of work, but how exciting and extraordinary. So are there many original mandolins still in, in existence in museums? Yes. Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, many are in museums. Yeah. Many are in uh, private collections. Yeah. Uh, luckily, they're not as expensive as uh, historical, I don't know, violins or celli. I see. So you you could you could own I mean I own three right at the moment and I am not a rich man <laughs> so it's <Yeah>. possible. <laughs> Fantastic! Wow. And do, do you travel with them? You're you're careful with them and you bring them to on tour. Of course. All the time. Yeah. They're all uh, perfectly playable and uh, each one has its own character, its own voice, and it's always inspiring to think uh, which uh, hands played it uh, earlier. Totally wonderful. Um, so let's talk about that. Well, you have five concerts while you're here in a period of 10 days, so you'll be busy. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through some of them. But the main one I wanted to speak about is your solo program, which is Plucked Bach. Uh, this is a really interesting project. I'm sure people want to know about it. Uh, you're transcribing basically Bach pieces for not only solo instruments, but anyway, tell us a little bit maybe um, how it's how it got started, what sparked it, and uh, it's already mm. got two albums, so a fantastic project, really. Congratulations! But uh, yeah, tell us Thank about you. its reception. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a project that it, it's already two albums, and I think if no one stops me, I would reach ten soon because uh, yeah, it's so. I've been living this music for a long time, um, Johann Sebastian Bach, and uh, the actual kind of bringing it to life was um, the project was in, in the drawer for, for a long time. And then what triggered it was actually the Corona pandemic mm -hmm. because most of it is in fact solo music. And in a time where I couldn't uh, join any orchestra and uh, even chamber music was complicated um, and we were forced to be at home, it was just the ideal thing to do. Um, and I started, uh, yeah, making things more concrete and uh, adapting, arranging, composing in the style of, or even not. Um, and it was like a, a bit of a snowball, which is still going. And it's wonderful. <laughs> so basically, um, I recorded the, a journey through the cello suites on six different plucked instruments. And that's the first volume, and the second volume is dealing with uh, works for violin mainly, but also for the lute and for the organ. For example, the Toccata and Fuga in D minor that I arranged for solo mandolin. And uh, I'm playing these recitals uh, in many different countries in the last uh, couple of years and in the next couple of years. And it's, it's a wonderful journey. It's yeah. always it's always a wonderful journey to do with the, with the audience and uh, yeah really. that's plucked Bach in a nutshell yeah 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 we're so looking forward to it and and in this version in Vancouver you're playing how many instruments in the plucked Bach concert? I will have three instruments. I will be uh, bringing uh, the mandolin with me and the oud, and I will also be playing the arch lute. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
we, we're very much looking forward to it. You you have many projects, really wonderful projects. Uh, I encourage people to go follow you on your YouTube videos and your website, of course. But you, uh, this morning, I discovered a completely new project on your website. I was checking it out and there's a new video and it's about Vienna and the mandolin. So I'm curious, can you tell us a bit about that one? Yeah, so here I jumped 100 years later, then Bach's time. Um, the mandolin is known to have quite an amount of repertoire in the Baroque. And again, in the 20th century, there was a time it was en vogue and of course, modern uh, li literature. But all this um, Mozart, Beethoven's time, it, were, it is today very much in the shadow of, of everything else. And we know of a few uh, pieces which became famous, like the Canzonetta of Don Giovanni um, by Mozart, or there are a few miniatures by Beethoven that you hear sometimes on stage, very occasionally. Um, and there is one mandolin concerto by Ioanne Pamuk Hummel, who made it kind of to the core repertoire when, when a mandolinist is invited. And uh, I always had the feeling there is more than that. And uh, I started researching. I already had one uh, project around that called Paisiello in Vienna. This was dealing with chamber music and salon, where the mandolin was highly popular, especially in the um, 18, 18, 1810. And now um, uh, two pieces for mandolin and orchestra were discovered in the state, um, a very state library in Munich. And uh, they are, it's a combination of work by an Italian virtuoso called Pietro Vimercati and uh, a Viennese oboist and Chacan player called uh, Ernest Kremer. Chacan is something like, something between a recorder and an oboe. It has the mouthpiece of a recorder, but it has, uh, and it was extremely popular for about 10, 20 years in the in the early 19th century. Um, we find the most obscure things. There was a chacan that served as a walking stick and was played. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> maybe, maybe when it went out of style, they would try, what can we use this for? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Never yeah. So I'm I'm recording these pieces by uh, Kremer Vimalcati, which are adorably uh, delightful. They're really, really nice. In combination with a concerto that I kind of sort of recomposed out of three different concerti of Joseph Haydn. Oh. So it's uh, Haydn's mandolin concerto in C major. And it's composed from, uh, the first movement is from the cello concerto. Second movement is from a violin concerto in C major and the third movement is an oboe concerto, which was associated with Haydn for many, many years. We have uh, many editions and, uh, and uh, recordings saying Haydn's oboe concerto. Today we know it's not Haydn, but that's not so important. No, so you're, you're very authentic. You're borrowing material, uh, making it your own, which is what every composer did back then and player. Exactly. Um, so I have a question which might be, I don't know if you know the answer, but um, you know, some instruments are known to be more played by women historically than by men, like uh, the par-dessus de viol and things like that. Is the mandolin, was it played by a particular genre, do you know? Uh, yeah, it was also more associated with uh, girls, girls of good education. <laughs> well, it's just a wild yeah. guess on my part, but uh, that's that's interesting to know. So that's yeah, why I'm, I mean, the, the instrument... The instrument was so pretty. It was often uh, made with um, ivory and, and shells and stuff. And it was basically half a jewel, half an instrument. They, there are so many portraits of, uh, of girls from noble families holding the instrument for, you know, I don't know if they ever played it, but it was something you kind of, you have at home and you, you play for fun. Yeah. Hanging on the wall. In the usual case. And then the, the exceptional case are the virtuosi who also wrote concerti and sonatas and, and yeah. performed in different uh, Parisian halls and, and so on. And, and there might have been female virtuosi. We don't know about them necessarily, but there could have been, obviously. Of course. Yeah. Obviously. Um, 
So this brings us to maybe, uh, well, you're, you're doing a, a concert with our Pacific Baroque Orchestra, which is also has, it's all mandolin. So some Bach, uh, Italian concerto, and also some Neapolitan uh, concertos like Paisiello and Barbella. Are you are you bringing a Neapolitan instrument or an Italian instrument? Or I wish I could bring all my arsenal to Vancouver. You know, <laughs> this is always this is always the catch because um, it's uh, living the life in the twenty first century uh, with touring, with uh, humidity, air conditioners, airports, and so on. Um, it comes with limitations. Yes. And uh, I think, yeah, I mean, in the 18th century, you just had that one mandolin and then you were traveling with it. And, and... yeah, but uh, we have to make some compromises and I'm sure uh, it yeah. would be great nonetheless. Oh, yes, I'm not worried at all. And we always, we always make compromises, like just even in terms of like, there were so many different pitches being played at over, you know, maybe a period of 30 years and then in another city, it's a different pitch. And these days we have to find compromises. Just are we playing at 440? This is maybe uh, getting into the nitty gritty of the Baroque world, but but these are questions for a festival that are really quite crucial when you only have a few instruments to do the whole festival. Um, there's another, uh, apart from playing in some of the other concerts in the festival and uh, playing with our, our Baroque Orchestra mentorship, uh, band, the Bomp Band, which is going to be fantastic. So wonderful for the students and the community players to have a chance to play with you. Um, there's an exploration also of uh, music from India and Italy, where you'll play the Theorbo. Uh, really uh, amazing diversity. And since you love diversity, I think we've hit it right with you. But uh, we also have a course. Uh, I just want to say a few words about this course, which is going to be uh, uh, at UBC for three days and invited to participants, but also for listeners. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this, since you it's really uh, your your decision and your creativity that made it happen? Yeah. So I thought, as I'm presenting the program, uh, Plakt Bach, and this program, yeah, it's, as I said, something which uh, accompanies me for so, so long and I have so much in me that I want to, to tell and to, to, to say about it. Um, why not meet also some, some students and make kind of a, a weekend uh, dealing with the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, not only on the mandolin and lute and so on, but really open for basically all instruments. I think we will have mostly uh, bowed uh, strings and, uh, and, and pluck and whoever comes is welcome, basically. And we will have some ensemble work. And um, I had this, this experience uh, in Brussels in the conservatory where I, I was studying. I was actually invited to give a master class about uh, Bach's music for the violin class. That was in January. And it was so inspiring. And I found this dialogue between um, my view coming from the mandolin, coming from the plectrum or the, or the fingers and the bowed instrument, it was really, really fascinating. And there was so much for us to uh, learn from this meeting point uh, for everyone in, in the room. I think uh, not only violins, but it's especially, um, especially a violin uh, sickness that um, people are often kind of very melodic we like like singers sometimes some singers um who are so kind of you know concentrated on the melody that they forget the context and and this bach music is so polyphonic and if you don't hear this polyphony you have no chance of transmitting it to the public and it all becomes kind of one level instead of multidimensional um of course, I mean, uh, this was a very uh, grob uh, generalization, you know, you have fantastic uh, singers and amazing polyphonic violinists, but uh, from the nature of the instrument, as, as a lutenist or mandolinist, um, we were talking about everything from, from fingerings until uh, voicing and counterpoint and which harmony do we actually hear in this, uh, under this and this note, and discovering the possibilities, I was playing a little bit of continuo and, and 
sometimes just even you know placing the cadences uh, clearing the the structure of a movement and before we even talk about ornamentation and all that there's so much to do and and it was so fun that i thought i want to do this again and uh, the chance came in in vancouver and yeah. I, i look forward to it yeah no no i'm looking forward also to attending um it, it, it's very interesting of course i mean it, like sometimes we can get stuck as you say when we're learning you know this diff so many difficulties on a violin and stuff and so important to go outside and and think of harmonic uh context in in a melodic in a solo piece and all these things it's going to be very very interesting i hope that we'll have lots of students coming and lots of people who just want to learn about how uh an, a musician works through you know this very difficult complex and beautiful music and 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 how you know from all these different elements that you work at it so uh looking forward to that and and i um just a little note because i forgot to say when we were speaking about your project in vienna uh that is coming up that you're working on now that uh, you're crowdfunding for that project at the moment that's uh, something that musicians have started to do by necessity uh, since quite a few years now And so I will be sharing the information about that uh, crowdfunding campaign at the end of the video for people. So stay tuned. Um, I, I noticed uh, just one, a couple more things, but more about you as a person uh, living in this time that many of your beautiful, beautiful videos are filmed outside. Um, and uh, I mean, that might be, I don't know if that's your choice or not, but um, I just wondered whether, obviously you're a nature lover because So many of them are in beautiful places. So uh, I don't know, tell us about that side of you. It's definitely a, a choice of mine. And, uh, and yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a great uh, nature lover and um, I engage also in animal welfare, welfare and this music between nature and this uh, combination, this uh, connection between music and nature is, you know, as old as it can get. You can see uh, Pythagor Pythagoras and so on. And uh, basically, maybe it's the look after beauty. Mm. You know, when we see n nature is, is always beautiful. It can be mighty, it can be even uh, disastrous, but it has something of beauty. Um, and maybe this is what we we try to to do with music. You know, we, we try to at least in the in the in our kind of music, um, we look for beauty. We want to uh, to share this beauty with the world. The flower is always beauty, beautiful. I never saw an ugly flower, and uh, and the music of Bach and so on. So when I When I concept these videos, uh, sometimes with different partners, it's uh, it's something that I, I do I do look for, and uh, if it fits, and uh, yeah, it, it, it does. Really from a from a viewer point of view, it's it's extremely effective. They're really beautiful, and they're they're very in touch with the music that you're playing. I think this is a a beautiful place to to end with this thought of bringing beauty into the world and uh, I think you'll be happy in Vancouver because the nature is really grand huge and uh, beautiful heard, yeah so so I hope Did I tell you I was in Vancouver as a child oh no I don't know that okay no so I I was living in the states for a year a sabbatical of my father's And we did uh, a short uh, visit to to visit a, a friend in Vancouver. I was very young; I was five or six, and I just remember it was raining the whole time, and everything was extremely green. Yes, <laughs> it's still like that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in the summer we have the sun usually, so it will still be green, hopefully. But. Uh... Yeah, well, that that's wonderful. I'm I'm glad to know that uh, we're bringing you back for your second visit, <laughs> and we are all so looking forward to your presence here, to your music, and uh, everything else that you have to share with us. 
thank you for this time this thank morning. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and especially this this uh, form of artist in residence. It's a possibility to to wear so many hats at a time. Something which is is rare. And uh, I look forward to meeting all the people in Vancouver and, and sharing stage with such remarkable artists. Thank you, Alon. Wonderful. We'll see you Thanks. soon. Bye-bye.